In this episode of Idea City. In 2009, I was in a hotel room and I had to look something up in the Bible for something I was writing. And I just had this epiphany that there were whole parts of the Bible I never read and don't know anything about. I could not, if you held a gun to my head, have told you what the difference was between Zephaniah and Zechariah. You know, I'm supposed to be a religion scholar, we're supposed to know stuff like that. Moses Neimer's Idea City Conference. Ideas change the world. So one day, Jana Reese realized that she and her faith had drifted apart, kind of like an old married couple. So she embarked on a mission to become more generous, more spiritually enlightened, more grateful. And the way she did it is that every month for a year, she adopted a different faith-related practice. She fasted, she studied the Bible, she renounced this and that, but somehow it didn't work out for her. Jenna. Thank you so much. So I'm here today to ask the question, can God take a joke? Uh, just to give you a preview, I really hope so, because otherwise I may be struck by lightning right in front of you, because I have a lot of fun making fun of religion. So in Flunking Sainthood, this was a, a project, as he said, that required me to take on a different spiritual practice every month. And so I started out with fasting as if I were a Muslim and it were Ramadan. I also tried an Orthodox Jewish Sabbath, uh, which was one of my favorite practices, but one of the ones that I violated immediately when I hit the alarm clock. I forgot that you should not hit the alarm clock, and then went downstairs and deactivated the house alarm and flipped off the porch light. So within two minutes, I was worthy of stoning, according to biblical tradition. Some other practices that I tried, I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. But the idea here is something that I got from uh, Father Jim Martin, who is the resident priest on the Colbert Report. So that makes him a modern sage in my eyes. And he said, if you're deadly serious, you're seriously dead. Which is unfortunately too true of many religious people today. So one of the practices that I tried was finding God in the kitchen. So you see a picture here of Brother Lawrence, who was a French monk that I thought was a saint. It turned out he actually was never canonized, which broke my heart. And Brother Lawrence had the idea that one could connect with God through menial tasks. So for many years, he in his monastery was the cook, and he claimed that a person could experience perfect oneness with God in the kitchen just by scrubbing pots and by cooking food. It, it turns out it's not actually true. At least it wasn't true for me. I wished very much that Brother Lawrence had left me an instruction manual, something with a checklist, something that I could feel that I, where I was making progress. But this idea of just sort of washing my pots and rather than listening to NPR, communicating with God was a little too abstract for me. So Brother Lawrence and I did not work out completely well together. Another practice that I tried in the month of June of that year, I actually uh, started with a practice called centering prayer, which is a kind of contemplative prayer, basically involves just sitting down and meditating for 20 minutes. In fact, the author of the book I was reading that month makes it clear that this is not prayer. You are not supposed to pray, you are not supposed to have a mantra, but it wasn't really clear, in fact, what I was supposed to be doing. So this chapter in the book is called Centering Prayer, crossed out, the Jesus Prayer, crossed out, look, a squirrel! And the reason for that was that I discovered pretty early on that I'm not a contemplative person and that I had the attention span of a puppy or possibly a gnat. Contemplative prayer is much harder than it looks. 
I can highly recommend it. If you're going on a spiritual retreat of any kind, seek out the Benedictines because St. Benedict, back in the fifth century, detailed that if a guest comes to a monastery, that that guest has to be received as Christ. Great ideas are meant to be shared. Join the discussion on Facebook. Timer's Idea City Conference. Ideas change the world. Another thing that I tried, which was one of my favorite practices, was hospitality. And I'd been inspired by the writings of Saint Benedict. If you've ever been uh, on retreat in a Benedictine monastery, you might have experienced Benedictine hospitality before. I can highly recommend it if you're going on a spiritual retreat of any kind. Seek out the Benedictines because St. Benedict, back in the 5th century, detailed that if a guest comes to a monastery, that that guest has to be received as Christ, as if that person were actually Christ. So, you know, you in the front row, you're, you're our Jesus today. You know, I would have to find out what your favorite food is. I would want to find out what it is that makes you happy and what kinds of things that we saw in the last presentation would really be good for you. And every individual is someone that we have to meet that way throughout life, which if you think about it is a radical and life-changing spiritual practice that we would regard each individual as divine in some way. So putting hospitality like that into practice in my own home the first thing I tried was actually on Facebook, by friending everyone who asked to be my friend, which is a pretty mild spiritual practice compared to some of the other things that I was doing, but to me it felt like a little step in the right direction. And then opening our home to strangers, including a dog that pooped in every room of our house, every single one, and also ran away, and some guests who came to our house. Hospitality is a gift. It's a gift, I think, that some people have, and the rest of us can develop. But one of the things that happened to me that month, even though I was not totally satisfied with how I was living out hospitality, I began to see it other places. I began to see it in other people. And one of the most surprising places for me was when I went to the gynecologist. And my gynecologist had knitted stirrup cozies. Seriously, she had hand-knitted stirrup cozy so her female patient's feet wouldn't be cold. Now, I've refrained from having a slide of this, but if you could just picture it in your mind. You know, the idea, I think, in her mind was to make patients completely comfortable, to make that feel like a homey environment, as if, so that if Jesus ever needs a pap smear, he'll know exactly where to go. Now, I can laugh about all these failures now, and perhaps I should move to Iceland. It sounds like they have a very good idea of failure. But at the time, it felt really rotten. I felt lousy about all of the failures that just kept racking up month after month, especially because I knew that I had been hired to write a book about spiritual practices that somehow set me up as an expert. And I felt increasingly like a fraud, that I could not write a book that put me up as an expert. Instead, I needed to be honest. And I had a good conversation toward the end of that year of practices with my editor, who pointed out that I was thinking about this in a very dichotomous fashion, that either I was a failure or I was a success. This either or thinking was not helpful for me. In fact, I, I really don't think it's helpful for most of us. But it's very easy to slip into that thinking. So she gently pointed out that there was another way to think about this book, which was to embrace the concept of failure and to have the courage to just laugh at failure, which turned out to be the book Flunking Sainthood. It turned out that the spiritual practices that I thought had been such total failures hadn't been complete failures after all. After I'd written the draft of the book and I turned it into my publishing company, I got a very surprising phone call from a hospital in Mobile, Alabama. 
Get the latest Idea City news instantly. Follow us on Twitter. Timer's Idea City Conference. Ideas change the world. The idea of flunking sainthood as it developed was that failure itself in my life turned out to be the most important spiritual practice of all. There's a real vulnerability though in writing about all of your nicks and scratches and the dents that happen in your life. It's hard to come clean about those things. But it's those failures that make us who we are. J.K. Rowling, who's one of my favorite writers, has said that failure represents a stripping away of everything that's inessential. When J.K. Rowling was in her late 20s, she felt like a failure. She had graduated from university, she had a baby, she had no job, and she had this dream she knew she was supposed to be a writer, even though everything in the circumstances of her life made it seem as though that dream would never happen. But what she took away from that is that the dream was something that she would make happen herself. And for me, it turned out that the spiritual practices that I thought had been such total failures hadn't been complete failures after all. After I'd written the draft of the book and I'd turned it into my publishing company, I got a very surprising phone call from a hospital in Mobile, Alabama to tell me that my, my father, whom I had not seen in 26 years, was dying and that I was the only family member and could I come to say goodbye? And they wanted to know, oh, by the way, he's on life support. Do you think that we should discontinue life support? Which was a shock, as you can imagine. I was completely stunned by this development. I called a friend from the airport and was sobbing and said, I don't think that I can do this. I don't feel like I can go there and forgive him. And she told me, very wisely, that even if I could not forgive him, that no one would judge me for that, but that it was my choice, and I chose to get on that plane. And when I arrived there, there was a tremendous peace, and I was able to forgive him from my heart. These spiritual practices that were done far from perfectly turned out to be very valuable in the end in helping me become the kind of person who could forgive someone who'd harmed me greatly. Sometimes we cannot see the benefit until much, much later, sometimes not at all. Another project that, besides flunking sainthood, that I wanted to talk about in terms of, of laughter in particular is called the Twible. In 2009, I was in a hotel room and I had to look something up in the Bible for something I was writing. And I just had this epiphany that there were whole parts of the Bible I never read and don't know anything about. I could not, if you held a gun to my head, have told you what the difference was between Zephaniah and Zechariah. You know, I'm supposed to be a religion scholar. We're supposed to know stuff like that. So I thought, why not do something on Twitter that would be a fun project, not just for me to learn, but for other people as well. So the Twible encapsulates each chapter of the Bible in 140 characters or less, but uh, the Bible now has 68% more humor than in the original version. So this is, this is a good thing. You can see here from early on in the project, it's really tough on Twitter to count characters, and it's very important to do that. So I was distressed when Abram's name became Abraham. You know, this really sucked for me. But I think it was worse for Abraham, who lost his part of his penis in this whole transaction, you know. Got to keep it in perspective. I'm not a doctor. I don't even play a doctor on TV. But I'm going to diagnose God right here. I think God has obsessive compulsive disorder in a massive way. So overview of Leviticus. Don't eat this. Don't screw that. Don't touch this. Don't do that. Thus saith the Lord. So that's Leviticus according to Dr. Zeus. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at ideacityonline.com.
Moses Neimer's Idea City Conference. Ideas change the world. So I learned some things from the Twible, three lessons I'd like to share with you. The first is there is a lot of crazy stuff in the Bible. Here we have Leviticus, bodily discharge, very bad, in both genders, wash your sheets. Don't even think about having sex. You just thought it, didn't you? <laughs> Leviticus, you might say, is obsessed with certain questions about ritual purity. In fact, lesson number two is that God has serious psychiatric issues. I'm not a doctor, I don't even play a doctor on TV, but I'm going to diagnose God right here. I think God has obsessive compulsive disorder in a massive way. So overview of Leviticus, don't eat this, don't screw that, don't touch this, don't do that, thus saith the Lord. So that's Leviticus according to Dr. Zeus. I would also put my money on God having intermittent explosive disorder. God has a massive and unpredictable temper in the Bible and possibly multiple personality disorder. I think that the 400 years between the Hebrew Bible Old Testament and the New Testament are the time when God ducked out and got a lobotomy. But one of the coolest things about the Bible is that most people are entirely relatable, 100% human, people that we would recognize. They respond to situations in ways that we probably would do, would too. Jesus' disciples are completely clueless. Solomon behaves more like Tony Soprano than the elder statesman that we have come to imagine. And it turns out that Job does not have the patience of Job. So here we see him, he's sitting in a pile of cow dung. This is after God has removed all of his lands and wealth, God has struck down Job's family and killed all of his children, and this is all based on some pissing contest between God and Satan about whether Job will eventually curse God. Now, I want to point out also, as an aside, that this, this photo here comes from the uh, Brick Testament, the BrickTestament.com. The Twible Project is quirky, but the Brick Testament is awesome. This guy's entire life mission is to tell the story of the Bible sarcastically with Legos. I highly recommend that you check it out. So Job doesn't ever actually curse God, but he doesn't take his suffering lying down either. So he acts as his own legal counsel and essentially hauls God to court. Here you see him saying, my life used to be so blessed, I helped the poor, WTF happened. In chapter 30, now I'm mocked and hated. Why? And why is God not answering my calls? Oh, and my skin is falling off? What is up with that? So there's a lot of anger. I think a very understandable, reasonable anger here. Overall, I would say that God has a lot to answer for in the Bible. This is from Nahum chapter 2. I was reading Game of Thrones at the time and was weighing which is more violent, the Bible or Game of Thrones? The Bible wins by a mile. So the Bible now only on HBO. For some people, the Twible is a little too irreverent, a little bit, a little bit too edgy. I got one text message after I had done Judges 19, which is a very gruesome scene in the Bible where a man chops up his wife into 12 pieces and sends each piece to a tribe of Israel. And this person was complaining because I had said that he'd chopped up his wife in a Cuisinart. And I wanted to say, have you read the actual Bible? You know, which is more offensive, the Cuisinart or the fact that a man is chopping up his wife? Really? That's what we're offended by. God has a lot to answer for in the Bible. But the point of the Twible is to laugh. And I have had a great time laughing G.K. Chesterton, who's one of my favorite writers, said that angels can fly because they hold themselves lightly. I'm not an angel, but humor has been an important part of spiritual growth for me, an essential part. Karl Rahner sums it up by saying, laugh, for this laughter is an acknowledgement that you are a human being. How else is a person to acknowledge God except through admitting in his life and by means of his life that he himself is not God but a creature that has his times? A time to weep and a time to laugh, and the one is not the other. A praising of God is what laughter is because it lets a human being 
be human. So my charge to you is have a belly laugh today about something, whether it's religion or something else. Contribute to your happiness quotient by doing that. Hold yourself lightly and go forth in laughter. Thank you. Thank you, very nicely. Let's have a picture. There we go. The idea city is a place where ideas come face to face to inspire and give us hope. At this time, our planet needs it. Most idea city is a place Everybody sing. where ideas come face to face to inspire and give us hope. At this time, our planet needs it. Most idea city has got to bring your ideas to idea city. <laughs> Come face to face to inspire and give us hope. At this time, our planet needs it. Most idea city is a place where ideas come face to face to inspire and give us hope. At this time, time, our planet needs it. Most idea city is a place Everybody sing. where ideas come face to face to inspire 